Good morning. Welcome in. We have college football this weekend. I'll take it. Northwestern in Nebraska. And uh, your mighty Vanderbilt Commodores going against the uh, Hawaii Rainbows. Many of you will bet the game. Uh, I already know several of my friends that will be all over it, about 19 different ways. So we'll get it kicked off and go from there. And then we'll have a full slate of games for uh, Labor Day weekend, which is super exciting. This is the Out of Bounds Show, ESPN 105.9 The Zone. Uh, you can bundle your car and home and save with your local Farm Bureau insurance agent in any of the 82 counties in the state of Mississippi. Farm Bureau Insurance. You're listening to ESPN 105.9 The Zone. Our guests join us on the Yingling Lager guest line. And over the weekend, I watched the Manti Teo uh, documentary on the Notre Dame fighting Irish linebacker out of Hawaii who was catfished and, um, you know, ter- heart, heartbreaking story um, when you watch it and you really get the, the full story because it was so many moving parts and you're busy and everybody's busy in life when it was going down in 2012 and 2013 and how it may have cost him, you know, a few years in the NFL too after getting drafted in the second round, our next guest was all over the documentary Uh, as the head of recruiting for ESPN and national college football analyst with ESPN. And he is Tom Luganbill on the Yingling Lager guest line. Lugs, um, have you watched the documentary on Manti Teo? Oh yeah. 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 I've, I've watched it and um, you know, initial impression that the conclusion of it is everybody and their brother owes Manti Teo a, public apology you know and um i think more than anything what this documentary reveals is the seedy despicable underbelly of what you know social media is capable of you know because it was such low-hanging fruit right and for everybody to just jump all over it of course make the assumptions um you know not really have any valid verifiable information as to what really went on i was really kind of uh i I felt relieved for the kid because to go through what he went through um and to just get nitpicked and to get torn down i think it's great that uh, everybody kind of finally knows the truth now tom luganville on the out of bounds show uh he's all over the manta teo um documentary uh and it is heartbreaking it's also mind-boggling that he was as naive as he was but it just happens in life uh when was the first time tom luganbill that you either knew about him or saw film on him or maybe watched him play at an all-star game depending on where you were way back then uh we had seen him right after his freshman year um and then where he really exploded was during the course of his sophomore year and then he just became a a a nationally recognized recruit because, you know, just like we've seen since then with Tua Tunga Valoa, you know, when you're out there on the Island and, 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 and you're, and you're not somewhere where you're going to be able to attend this camp in this combine and create exposure for yourself. The only thing that's going to create exposure for you is your style of play and your production. So it goes to show you just how productive he was to jump onto the national landscape um, off of ability and, and take study alone. And then we ended up seeing him, I believe, on the West Coast for either at that time what would have been a Nike football regional camp. Um, and then eventually we ended up inviting him to the Under Armour All-America game out of the 2009 class. We got to spend a week with him in Orlando uh, down there at that time. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I think I've said this to you before about many, many, many prospects over the years. When 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 you put all of these guys in one environment for let's just say a week and they're all battling against each other. And for the first time, they may not be the best guy on the field. Sometimes you can come away from that week and have a pretty good idea of who's going to succeed, who's going to sink, who's going to fail. Uh, maybe who, who's going to be a no brainer. 
Um, and a lot of that just comes from body language, how they interact, how do they respond to failure, how, what do they do when they get their tail kicked in a drill. And this guy was so mature and so far beyond um, what normal 17-year-old kids were at that stage. I mean, you looked at him and you watched him play and you're like, this guy can make a practice squad. Like this, this, this dude could literally – He's physically and mentally advanced enough to do that. And then, of course, fast forward throughout his, his career, he, he uh, decides to come back, play four full years, ends up in doing so playing for a national championship. But, I mean, what a, what a stellar career. And you're right in your comments. You know, had none of this taken place, um, you know, maybe he goes in the latter part of the first round or the middle part of the first round. He still played, I think, seven, eight years and, and, and good for him. But, the naivety as far as him being so devoted and in love with an individual that he had not seen, I think that's the one thing we, we all feel capable of criticizing because you're sitting there scratching your head going, how, how did you get to this point and never see that person? But to see the truth come out about what really went down I think is refreshing and, and, and obviously probably take the load off of his chest. Mm. Uh, Tom Lugan bills in the documentary, uh, the man Tateo documentary. He got catfished hoaxed. Um, it was terrible. The, 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 the man slash woman never even really showed remorse in the knock, which is, and it's, it's Naya to a Sosopo um, was a male during that time. Now a female, and and that's sad. Um, it, it, there's so much to unpack here. <laughs> it, it, so with with Manti, you you were around him and obviously had several conversations with him that week at the Under Armour All American game that he was oh, in. Sure. Okay. Sure. You so know, so and, you talk about yeah. so he's both mature and uh, you can be this in life. Okay. So he's he's both a mature. A lot of times those families where he grew up, that that was very structured, uh, a lot of discipline, a lot of responsibility. Um, there's no nonsense. They're they're very religious, structured, and so yeah. on, right, Luke's? And yep. and then on the flip side is when you're from Hawaii and a remote island within the Hawaii, mm-hmm. um, and, and back then he didn't have a I mean, from what I gathered, he had no access to much, uh, cell phone, social media, Correct. so on. Um, so what you're telling me is by the time he gets to the Under Armour All-American game, and he's a big-time recruit between Southern Cal and, and Notre Dame, among others, he is both mature and really good at football, but he's also naive and kind of he hasn't left the island much and doesn't right. know what's going on in the world. Is that Correct. And, and, and they outline in the documentary, for those who haven't seen it, that, you know, him being outside of his little cocoon of, of a Polynesian culture, an island culture, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in South Bend, Indiana. Uh, you know, think about that. I mean, just think about what that would do to most 17 and 18 year old kids. And when I talk about maturity, let's fast forward that signing to right now. And they also discussed this in the documentary how miserable he was and how he wanted to leave Notre Dame and how he he just he didn't fit in the whole nine yards what would 99 percent of prospects do if it was right now gone gone jump right into the transfer portal this guy had the mental fortitude and the mental toughness and the commitment to the game and I think the commitment to the university to battle through that it wasn't easy it was hard it put a lot of pressure on him. He was already expected to be this otherworldly prospect. So you've got that on your shoulders as well. And you're so far removed from your normal culture and your normal comfort zone. There's no doubt that takes a level of maturity that is, is I, I think, of the highest accord. I, there, there's, a, there's a lot of people that at that same time would have been four or five years older than him that wouldn't have handled that the way that he did. But with that, I think I got this sense a little bit came uh, a a sense of loneliness, a sense of Mm -hmm. isolation to some degree, which may have led to him falling into the the, the trap of, of 
you know, an interlude on Facebook that turned into, you know, obviously something, at least initially, that was an intellectually intriguing relationship that we all know what it, it, it developed into. But I give him a lot of credit for just hanging in there. And to be honest with you, had he bolted and left and went home or bolted and left and transferred back out west to SC or somewhere else, who's to say any of this would have ever happened? That's true. That's true. It, it's a fascinating story. I wonder if he will ever, over time, um, be embraced by Notre Dame as as a hero and, a, and an amazing player again. You know, in the next few years, Tom. How could he not be? I mean, think about the, you could say, arguably the greatest on-field season Notre Dame has had since 1988 was the reason he came back. I don't think that season happens with with him departing early through the NFL. I think not only does that take away from the talent of the overall defense, but it also takes away from the leadership of your locker room, the chemistry of your locker room. Now, hey, maybe they would have. Maybe they would have had a magical year anyway. But you can't tell me that would have been the same team without him on it. Yeah. And and the fact that he never regained his confidence and he talks about how he was playing downhill by his sophomore, junior, and senior year at Notre Dame. Yeah, oh, um, yeah. And, and I'm not going to go crazy and think that he was a Hall of Famer because I don't think he was. I think he was more suited. The game was starting to transition, but he was more suited for the game between the tackles. Um, I agree. But but still could have had a, a a better NFL career. But when he talks in episode two about never regaining his confidence, that's right. another part uh, piece of the puzzle where your heart just breaks for him. Because he, he couldn't get it together at San Diego like he should have. Well, think about it. You know, he always had such faith and trust and confidence in his own ability. And when that trust and faith was broken in one area of his life, it fractured his entire life. And he began to lose confidence in anything he was seeing, anything he was hearing. Um, He was continually second guessing himself. And think about that from a, just from a mental psyche perspective of a young person to go through that and not just to go through what happened, but to do it in the era of the internet And being held, this would have been a horrible thing to have had happen to anybody, uh, let alone somebody in that age group. But imagine had it not happened in the era of the Internet. And really nobody ever found out about it publicly. That's an entirely different thing that we're talking about here. Because you can't can't hide. I mean, remember that, that scene in season two where they're talking about he was going to prepare for the NFL draft and he goes down to IMG yeah. and he's working and grinding this and that. And his agent calls him and says, you need to get out of there right yeah. now. And from that moment on, remember he tried to leave on a golf cart yeah. and he goes out of the gate at IMG and he says, are they all here because of me? From that moment on, his life and his career was never the same. Yeah. Ha- have you, uh, have you talked to him since? Yeah. I have not. I have not talked to him since probably his junior year of college. Okay, if you could ask him one question today, mm-hmm. Tom Luganbill on the Yingling Liger guest line, if you could ask Manti Teo one question today, what would it be? Throughout the entire process, why didn't you ever demand to be able to either face-to-face virtually see this person or demand via travel by plane, by car, whatever, get together with this person in real life. If you, if your love and devotion was so deep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. I, it's just for our listeners, it's a good look. You're, you're still trying to get to Labor Day weekend. Um, I know I am. Oh, it's a great watch. And it's I mean, a, it's a an, really good watch. Uh, you'll have an entirely different sense of this entire debacle and how you viewed him, how you'll view him now, and you'll you'll feel terrible. You'll feel mm-hmm. terrible, um, especially if you're somebody that on the internet's making memes or you've been somebody that's 
you know, just bought into the whole thing because it was easy. It was a low hanging fruit and you're a hurtful person. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's eye opening. Mm. He won every single award there is to win. Um, Except for the Heisman, absolutely. Uh, yeah, and, and look, I do also agree um, that uh, probably didn't deserve, because of the story and Notre Dame, the allure of Notre Dame, I, he probably didn't deserve to be a Heisman finalist, but the bottom line is, you know, he did have an amazing year, and then the story with the grandmother and what people thought was the girlfriend – Oh, you know, yeah. pushed him over with with vote Man, for our listeners. Manzel won that year, and you can say what you want about Manzel as a person or whatever, but he was dynamic, uh, explosive, electric that oh, year, and boy. amazing. So, um, that's pretty cool though that Luganville was in the dock and knew him from the uh, Under Armour All American game and the Nike camp even before before that. All right, we're gonna switch gears. Um, big news for Lane Kiffin and Ole Miss yesterday. Um, Aiden Williams, wide receiver out of Ridgeland High School, which is literally five minutes from where I'm sitting, uh, commits to Ole Miss over LSU, among others. He's 6'3", 200 pounds. Tom Luganbill, what is Ole Miss getting in Aiden Williams? Well, I think he's one of those guys that is is a, a truly dynamic, you know, difference maker type of player. Um uh, both quick and fast. I think that's the one thing that I'm starting to notice more and more and more uh, when it comes to um, prospects now. We're finding that prospects are they're either quick or they're explosive or they're fast, but very few prospects are all of those things in one, right? And so to me, that, that's a big thing, man, because it's, it's, it kind of – Depending on the school, depending on the place, depending on what's asked of you, you don't necessarily have to have it all, if, if that makes sense. You, you, you can have an area where you're really, really strong. You can have an area where maybe you're slightly deficient, but you don't have to have every single attribute to be this guy that um, everybody says, wow, he's a no-brainer, he's a can't-miss, because there's no such thing uh, uh, in terms of those things. I think the other thing that stands out to me about him is he's a really polished route runner. Um, and that's not, that's not something that is easy to establish as a young player because oftentimes these kids don't pay close attention to it because they don't have to, right? They're always the best guy. They're always the most um, talented player. They rarely have somebody in front of them that uh, can challenge them. So when you see a young player that's put an attention to detail to be a route runner that already has physical attributes, to me, I think that that's really, really impressive. And when you look at his size, when you look at his size, this is a player that is very difficult to tackle in the open field after the catch. So he's not just a run and catch guy or a run and jump ball guy. He's the type of player that after the catch is capable of making the next person miss, but then also capable of stiff arming and making the next guy go to the ground because he's so difficult to tackle due to his size. Tom Lugan, Bill, in the Yingling Lager guest line. We're talking about Aiden Williams, wide receiver out of Ridgeland who committed to Ole Miss yesterday over LSU and others. So give me a comp for, for Aiden Williams. Oh, that is a really, really good question. I might say... Um, Hmm, let me give that some thought here. You put me on the spot with that one, and I kind of like that you have because every time you have big guys that are fast, it's tough to find somebody to comp them to sure. because you don't often have uh, that when, when, it, when it comes to it. I might say Cedric Tillman at Tennessee. Cedric's about six foot three, about 210, 215 pounds. This kid's about 190, 191. I think he'll probably end up being between 205 and 210 um, at the collegiate level, similar in height but deceptively fast given their size. So that's the comp I'd probably give you. And so you think he could be a big-time, big-time player at the collegiate level? Oh, absolutely. And I think that the size that he brings, coupled with the ability to, to, uh, to, to get over the top and either run past people or be that guy because of his size that goes up and wins the 50-50 ball, 
Um, that's the most difficult thing right now in, in, I think, in college football to defend. People are having such a difficult time when the ball is thrown up for grabs and there's a 5'11 corner and a 6'3 wide out. It's a mismatch. Right. Like, how are you supposed to defend it? It's so difficult. Uh, is he a better prospect than – I know they're different size stylistically, and this guy was unbelievable in doing it in the NFL – is he a better prospect right now in his career than A.J. Brown? Mm, I don't know if I'd say that. Okay. I thought he might be taller than A.J. Brown. A.J. Brown was a step on the campus first day better than what Ole Miss already had, as evidenced by what he did, right. obviously. Um, that guy was, uh, and still is, I think, a flat-out difference maker. Mm -hmm. Okay. And – do you have anything on – I'm going to put you on the spot again. Tom Luganville okay. on the Out of Bounds show. I want to move to one more guy. Do I have time? Yeah. Uh, one more. Sure we have time. Ja <laughs> Jamarius Brown from Moss Point. He's an – of course, Moss Point has pumped out some unbelievable players over the years. South Mississippi, he's an edge rusher, Lukes. Do you know anything about him? What class is he? Is he a is – he a a 20 he's 2023 he's the fifth 20. rated player in in mississippi right well on 247 sports he's a 91 rating 6'3, 250 edge rusher out of moss point yeah so this is a guy that plays in a variety of roles he plays with his hand on the ground also plays from a stand-up position so i think he would be what what is defined as a true edge type player um i think he's a guy that is somewhat developmental in the sense that he flashes power, he flashes strength, but I think he's going to improve with more development. His first step quickness, I think, is something that needs to continue to improve as far as explosiveness and get off. It's above average. I think it's more than adequate, but it isn't, is it in the elite category right now? I don't think so. Now, let's keep in mind, it's about 225 pounds. So we're, we're talking about a player that a year or two years from now could end up being upwards of 255 pounds. And then now that all of a sudden may change where he aligns, how he lines up, may take him out of a stand-up role, put him down with his hand on the ground, either as a, a seven technique or a five technique or what have you. So um, a good, a high-end guy that, shoot, everybody's offered him, Auburn, Alabama, Old Miss, Florida State. So he's, he's a guy, obviously, that's highly coveted out of the state of Mississippi. We've got a minute or less. John Rice Plumley named the starter for Gus Malzahn in Central Florida. What's your reaction? Uh, not surprised at all. I think when, when, we, when we spoke last week, one of the things that I reiterated about that offense is it's always been operating at its most efficient when the quarterback is a runner. They can do all of the things they need to do in the passing game, play action pass, move the pocket. But when the, quarter the, runner, the quarterback's a runner, that's when that offense has been at its best. I hope he has a monster year. Me I too. really do. I think he could be a lot of fun to watch. Um for Gus and Central Florida. That was fun, man. Have a good week. We'll talk next week. All right. Thanks, man. See you. Tom Luganbill with ESPN on the Yingling Lager guest line brought to you by Farm Bureau Insurance. Bundle your car and home and save with your local Farm Bureau Insurance agent. As Jake Mangum says, go local. Go with the home team. Bundle your car and home and save with your local Farm Bureau Insurance agent. We're live in the Bank Plus studio. Good morning. Welcome in on a Monday. We are that much closer to college football and Labor Day weekend.